What's it like to mix big bands when you can have 17, 21 pieces as an audio uh, engineer? Well, it's pretty interesting because you've got an awful lot of people on stage. You have potentially quite a few microphones on stage, and that can be problematic. Uh, it depends also on the room acoustics. But, you know, here the main goal is to make sure that everything is heard. And personally, I like to mix it in such a way where it sounds organic and not overly amplified or artificial to preserve the integrity of that sound. Mm -hmm. But how do you mix so many instruments in a balanced way? Um, well, I have been doing this for quite a while. And also, sometimes, I have to tell you, the mics are not on. and the things that are louder on stage, sometimes we just let them carry through the room. Like, and I like percussion? Uh, possibly percussion, sometimes trumpets. Trumps are loud and they stand up, so they project from the, from the back all the way out. And then things that need a little help, like piano and flutes and voices and upright bass, things like that, those are always giving a little help too. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to get recognized in what you do? Yes, and I would say that my goal is to not be noticed, actually, uh -huh. because if you're paying attention to what I'm doing in the back of the room, then I'm doing something wrong. I want you to notice the performance, and I want you to walk away from that, not going, hey, the sound guy did a great job, I want you to walk away from that going, mm -hmm. that band sounded really good. Um, how many of these recordings, uh, these, uh, these performances do they record? I'm not recording any, um, so I, I don't think that that's a priority here at this particular event. Uh -huh. Is it contractual that the musicians need to get paid extra by the union if it's recorded? If they are union, I believe it is uh -huh. contractual, yes. So I never record an artist unless they specifically ask me to. But uh, even for archival purposes, do festivals like this typically record? Not, not the ones that I do, no. Really? Not typically. Uh -huh. So it's like uh, ice sculpture, once it melts. This is in the moment. It's like jazz, it's all in the moment. It's different every time you hear it. Every night you can hear the same song every night. It won't be the same if it's jazz. It's improvised. Mm -hmm. and it, 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 is it comparable to miking uh, a symphony or is it different? Again, depends on the environment. Uh, if you're in a live hall, um, uh, acoustically live hall, you may not need to use any mics for a symphony or maybe just a few spot mics for soloists and things. So it really depends on the environment more than the musical style. And are there special mics for particular instruments? <clears throat> well, everybody has their favorites. Um, there's certainly a wide variety of things to choose from. And uh, usually, like most things, you get what you pay for. So if you buy the good mics, I usually get the good sound. But on the saxophones, you're using SM58s. Actually, those are Beta 58s. Oh, beta, even, even cheaper, aren't they? No, no they're oh, slightly they're, more, expensive. Oh, they are more expensive. But I get your point. It is not a very expensive mic. Um, but one of the benefits of using a mic like that is that everybody knows how to use it. And a lot of times mm -hmm. that can be just as important as having a fancy mic mm -hmm. as having a player who understands how to work that mic. When people watched uh, Jerry Lewis' telethon, they would imagine that there were shifts of, of crews doing these kinds of performances. Usually in a, a theater you've got one setup, everyone gets a head-worn microphone, and it's pretty basic. But here, how many different setups do you have to change for? Well, I'm fortunate this year because it's almost entirely big bands. Mm -hmm. So there are slight variations between the bands, but uh, most of the time it's five saxes and four or five trombones and four or five trumpets and a full rhythm section. So the setup isn't changing all that much, mm -hmm. though the style of music mm -hmm. changes quite a bit. And do the drums stay, or does everybody bring in their own kit? Uh, the drums pretty much stay. Uh, we only have about, usually about 20 minutes to get one band off stage and the next band on stage. So in order to uh, speed up that process and 
give the customer the most music possible, we share a lot of the same instruments. How many amplifiers. How many bands do you uh, mic in a, a given day here, to, here at this festival? Uh, there's probably about eight or nine bands in a day. So sound checks, do you do a sound check or you just... Uh, wait? Generally, there's no time for a sound check. Really, yeah. Um, if there's a singer, she might get 30 seconds to just make sure she can hear or he can hear herself. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's about as far as we go. I ask the people on stage as soon as they come up if they need anything in particular, but uh, no, nothing I would call a serious sound check. There's no time for that. Uh, what's the name of your website? SpecialEventAudio.com And where do you operate out of? Uh, I'm based in uh, northern San Diego County. How far do you travel? As far as I need to. Will you go to the East Coast? Sure. Go to Europe, wherever. Uh, and uh, for jazz, is it mostly acoustic? Do you specialize in or? <clears throat> I do a lot of uh, sound for jazz. Uh, I don't want to say I specialize in that because if you're in the business I'm in, you do everything. Um, I do everything from congressional meetings, which I did last week, hmm. to symphonies, to rock and roll shows. Uh, I think we're doing Casey and the Sunshine Band here in a few weeks. Um, so it's a little bit of everything. But I have to say that this might be my favorite. Because it's more challenging? No, because like we were talking about earlier, it's more in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I like that. I used to be a jazz musician myself, so oh, good, good, good. so I appreciate it and I understand it. You know, even though things are spontaneous, there's a certain language of jazz in particular. Mm -hmm. And if you read the body language and you kind of speak the language of jazz, this becomes a very easy thing to do. Why would you say that uh, when people go to concerts these days, whether they're in clubs, you know, nightclubs or uh, larger, even arenas, why is it so bassy? Yes, well, in certain kinds of music, I think that's kind of prevalent. Um, I think sometimes it's almost a macho thing. And um, the guys who put up the sound system, um, they like to flex their muscles a little bit. And that's maybe a small part of it, but sometimes the music demands that. It really depends on what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's rap or reggae or something that's inherently bass heavy, right. that's what you're going to get. Yeah, but, but when it isn't, has, uh, have the ears of audio mixers changed? I think styles change. And so engineers, just like, you know, consumers of music, their preferences change. Uh, so I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I've experienced it myself. Um, it's, it's a stylistic preference of the audio engineer, which really just goes to show you how much impact uh, we have on the show. Yeah, a lot. We who shall be nameless and unseen have on the show. Is it an issue which is addressed within the audio community? Uh, certainly there are discussion forums on the internet where people talk about such things. Yeah. And, um, or the magazines, Live Sound magazines? Uh, yeah, that's, that, you named a good one, Live Sound. Uh, there's several others. Um, yeah, this is something that's discussed. Uh, and do the guys who play it too bassy, do they actually read those magazines? Uh, they don't generally read the sound magazines. <laughs> <laughs> the guys that play it a little too bassy, uh, who knows what they're reading. <laughs> they probably don't want to be criticized, so... <laughs> They're probably not reading those magazines. Uh -huh. But at a jazz concert like this, especially acoustic jazz, it's rare, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of times jazz is played in a very intimate setting. Uh -huh. So um, guys like me aren't often needed. Uh, but when you get in a bigger venue, of course, you know, then my job, at least the way I view it, is to make it feel like an intimate venue. Uh -huh. Of course, how many seats are here? That's a good question. I would guess uh, three to four hundred. Well, I guess for people in Beverly Hills, that can be an intimate party. <laughs> it, 
could be <laughs> if you have the square footage in the house yeah. you, you could have a party that big but the, the idea is to uh is to make it feel comfortable rather than uh imposing i think so i think um you know the last thing you want to do is make this kind of situation feel stiff and formal you know these are people having fun yeah. uh, playing music they enjoy and having a good time that's really what jazz is about